Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Um, I'm Jennifer Chernagel, uh, the Senior Project Manager for the Simons Variation in Individuals Project, or Simons VIP. Uh, the goal of Simons VIP is to identify and study large numbers of individuals uh, that share recurrent genetic variants known to um, increase the risk of developing autism spectrum and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, the long-term goals of the project are to use these data um, to develop targeted interventions and focus clinical care. And one of the variations uh, studied by Simons VIP is the HIV EP2 gene. Our first presentation today will go over what we've learned so far about the HIV EP2 cohort and uh, what the broader research community has learned through other investigations. I'm really happy to in introduce our first presenter, Dr. Wendy Chung. Dr. Chung serves as the principal investigator for Simons VIP, um, and she's working to build a community of indiv individuals with autism and their families, uh, working with them to better understand the causes of autism and to develop uh, means of supporting individuals with the condition. She evaluates opportunities to develop new treatments and new outcome measures to evaluate the efficacy of these treatments. Um, she joined the Simons Foundation in 2012 as a director of clinical research after uh, serving on the Foundation's scientific advisory board for some time. Uh, Wendy is currently uh, the Kennedy Krieger Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine at Columbia University, uh, where she directs the clinical genetics program and performs human genetics research. Uh, at Columbia, she clinically assesses children with autism spectrum disorders and intellectual disabilities and uses advanced genomic diagnostic methods, including whole exome sequencing, to identify the underlying genetic basis for neurologic conditions. So um, join me in welcoming Wendy, and uh, thanks for kicking off tonight's meeting. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, so hopefully everyone can see the slides, and hopefully I'm actually controlling these now. Um, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their busy schedule to be here. We're really excited. Um, I will admit this is the first time we're doing a virtual family meeting, so apologies if everything doesn't work absolutely perfectly, um, but we hope that this is an opportunity uh, to share back with the families everything that we've been learning. And we think that by doing this online, it gives more families a chance to join and for us to be able to speak with you more quickly than sometimes when you have to organize these things and travel. So um, we hope the experiment works and we'd love to hear your feedback afterwards for this. Um, this is just in case everyone didn't recognize, but I think you probably did. This is, uh, we hope, a unique gathering to show that we're all in this together. And what I mean by that is we've got families on the line, we've got uh, clinicians, we've got researchers. Um, you're gonna be hearing some tips uh, from uh, some of us that uh, deal with this professionally, um, but really we're all in this together and we want this very much to be a conversation. Um, so you've already, in terms of the families, you've already been an important part of the conversation and we appreciate all the input you gave us before starting the meeting terms of telling us what would be helpful and, and sharing in terms of uh, what you wanted to hear about. And so we've made the agenda tonight to focus on the things that you asked about. Um, you'll notice though that we don't have all the answers as we start going through this. In fact, I would say we have more questions than we have answers, um, but the important thing is to start with what we know and then to think forward about the things that we don't yet know. So you're gonna be uh, seen sprinkled through here. A lot of things we don't yet know, but we hope that together we're gonna be learning these things. In addition to what I'm speaking about, I'll speak for about 25, 30 minutes or so. And this is really what I'm gonna be speaking about is sharing back the information that you shared with us, as well as information um, that Sid has gathered through his studies, that I've gathered through my studies, um, but putting together all that information together, um, information that Nerissa has gathered as well from some of the families, uh, but aggregating that information. And this is information um, from a, mostly a medical and behavioral and neurological point of view in terms of what we know about the condition. Um, we'll have some time for questions. Um, and this is, I will say the agenda is a little bit free flowing, but we'll have some time for questions at the end of that. Uh, and then um, CORE is gonna have some time to deal with another question many of you asked about, which is dealing with some challenging behaviors and then to take questions after that. Um, at the end, what we're intentionally doing is taking all of us, meaning all the professionals, all the researchers, um, all of your providers, we're gonna actually go offline um, and we're gonna leave you as family members 
uh, to talk amongst yourselves. And you guys can talk into the wee hours of the night if you like. We'll leave the line open. Um, but we're going to use that time for your private time to talk with each other, share experiences, talk about us if you like. Um, but, it, you know, that's your time to be able to do this. So we wanted to set that up for you so you guys could share as well. Um, and like I said, we'll try and have this go and ho hopefully not keep everyone up too late. Um, so as we're doing this, uh, as I said, this information is gathered from what we know. Um, there's going to be a lot that we don't know, but I will share everything that we've gathered so far. So um, many of you know that this gene, HIV EP2, um, had something to do with the human immunodeficiency virus. Um, so I don't want, for the parents of you out there, I don't want you to panic. It doesn't mean your children have HIV. It doesn't mean they're gonna get HIV. Um, it's nothing like that. But this gene, this protein was originally identified as one of the proteins that actually binds to different DNA sequences, either in other genes in our body or in some cases to viruses. And that was one of its first recognized functions Although the connection with HIV, I think, is really probably a small part of what this gene does. In general, the gene is responsible for, it's kind of like a conductor in an orchestra, um, determining for many different genes that are expressed when to increase the volume, so when to make more of a gene produced, or when to be able to be quieter um, and have less of a gene produced. So it's, it serves as a coordination role um, in terms of especially brain development. Uh, and that's probably one of the issues that many of you have seen most in your children. Um, for this, it has an important role, as I said, in terms of brain growth and brain development. Uh, it also has some, probably some roles in other parts of the body, but if I were to say its most important role, it's probably within the brain. And I think we are still learning about some of its roles that it may play in either the immune system or different white blood cells in the body or other parts of the body. Um, but as you'll see when I'm going through things, it clearly is the case that it's had its, it has its greatest impact in terms of what we see in many of um, your children in terms of behavioral and neurological functions. So the next slide is actually taken from a, a paper that we had written put, putting together all the different mutations or genetic variants within the HIV EP2 gene um, that you've seen either in your children or in some of the other children. Uh, so within this, this is drawn just as a stick figure of the protein um, going from left to right. And each of those little, little lollipops sticking up shows um, for any one individual what their particular genetic variation is. And it's not so much, you may or may not recognize your child's genetic variation up here. Um, but the thing that's most important is that of, um, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, almost all of the ones on the right, with the exception of the one on the left, they're all um, things that essentially destroy the function of one copy of the gene. So they uh, lead to problems where that copy of the gene is not produced. For all of your children though, they still have one copy of the gene that's perfectly normal and working perfectly fine. And so that's what we rely on. And at some point we may try and figure out how to make more of that one copy that's working because it's still there and it's still working perfectly fine. Let's see. For all of your children, or at least all of the children um, of, which, of whom I'm aware, when we think of this in terms of where this came from, it's a bit sort of puzzling, but uh, we know it to be true, that these were not inherited genetic variants from any of the families uh, of whom we're aware. That is that in each of these cases, this was a genetic change that started first within the child. Um, they had a de novo genetic change. Um, we don't always know whether it was in the egg or the sperm, uh, but we do know that it was eventually in the child. And it wasn't something that the parents did that caused this. So it wasn't something a mother may have, you know, if she had a glass of wine during pregnancy or a cleaner she used. It wasn't anything that the mothers and fathers did that caused this particular uh, genetic change to happen. Um, but because it's not something that's in, in general, the mothers and the fathers in terms of all of the cells of their body, it's not something that's very likely to happen again. So for any of those of you who are parents who are thinking about having other children or you think about some of your, your um, children without the HIV EP2, when they grow up, are they going to have to worry about this? Uh, it's really not going to be an issue very likely for anyone else in the family, save your one child with HIV EP2. So I hope that provides some 
relief and reassurance and probably something you've heard from your genetics uh, professionals already. So this is still a very, very new and uh, I think under-recognized, under-diagnosed condition. I'm not saying, uh, I don't know at this point really how frequent it is, but I doubt it's um, you know, more than, for instance, one in 10,000. So it is a relatively rare condition. Um, some of you may have heard uh, Sid, who introduced himself earlier as one of the child neurologists. I just want to give Sid uh, a lot of credit. Um, he's an incredible child neurologist, uh, and he was actually the first one to recognize and describe this condition. Um, even with all of the cases that Sid had described, all of the cases that we've described, uh, as I said, we still only in the series you're going to hear about tonight are only including 12 individuals. So it's, there are some real limitations that I want everyone to appreciate um, in terms of only having 12 individuals in this series. So we clearly don't know everything about this condition. Um, as you'll see from the information I'm going to show you, the individuals who were included within the slides you'll see um, are ages 3 to 21. Uh, but it still means, for instance, we don't have individuals yet who we know who are 30, 40, 50 years old. So in terms of what the future holds for many of your children, I think we're still, to be honest, guessing at some of that. Um, they're educated guesses, but I don't think we know all of the future. Uh, within this, we do see that both boys and girls can have this. It's about 50-50, um, and that's what we expect based on the genetics. And I want to emphasize that in the slides you're going to be hearing about and seeing, uh, every child does not have all of the manifestations. And in fact, it's really um, I'll try and show you where I can the frequency, but many times a child will, will have a subset. In fact, all children will only have a subset of the features that I'm talking about. So for each of these slides that are going to follow uh, to the next, I think, six or seven slides, what you're going to see on the left is the particular feature uh, or diagnosis or clinical description. And then on the right side, you'll see the number of individuals um, and then the percentage of individuals. And in all cases, we didn't necessarily have people responding or have information about every single different condition. Um, so I don't know in all cases that we had 12 out of 12 respondents for things. Um, and I, sh I, I hope what Libby was saying made sense that if you don't um, sort of wanna, you don't have to write notes down about all of these, we're gonna be posting all of this afterwards. You're certainly welcome to take as many notes as you want to, but don't feel like you furiously have to write this down. This is being recorded and, and will be available to everyone. So all of the individuals that we've looked at so far, the one common feature that we've seen have been uh, neurological manifestations in terms of being delayed um, with the usual, what we would call milestones. So when children were learning to walk or talk, uh, or learning the various different things that children learn, um, they've been slower in terms of reaching those milestones. Um, in many cases, they have eventually made it to some of those milestones, but it's certainly taken a lot of patience in terms of teaching them how to be able to do some of these things. Um, in addition, uh, many individuals have been somewhere on the spectrum of autism. Um, it's been, you know, some of the features that we see in terms of uh, liking to have sort of regularity and, and need for sameness or need for consistency um, and predictability is something that um, many of the children feel more comfortable with. Um, and the children have had problems in terms of language development. Um, so either that they've been slower in terms of learning to talk, they may have gone through a period of using a communication device, using signing, and for some of them, they still are not yet verbal. Um, Remember, as I said, though, that um, many of the children are still young, and so uh, we don't yet know when exactly language is going to be coming in, and it may take some patience uh, in terms of that. In addition, many of the children, 11 out of 12, have had some sort of uh, behavioral problems of one sort or another, um, and we'll be getting into some of these and some of the challenges CORE is going to be addressing a little bit later. So in this next slide, I'm showing now some more of the um, other neurological and medical issues that have come up. So uh, some of the children have had structural differences in the way their body formed, so what we would call birth defects. Um, these have, have not been life-threatening sort of birth defects. And the one thing I want to reassure uh, the parents who are on the call is that these are things that form and are present at birth, and if they're not there, 
um, they're not going to suddenly develop. So what I mean by that is, for instance, if one of your doctors had done any sort of ultrasounds to look at your child's uh, kidney or heart or liver or anything like that, if they didn't find anything when they looked before, they're not going to find it when they, you know, to look again. So in other words, you don't have to keep having your child examined every single year to look at their heart or look at their kidneys. Um, if it wasn't there, you can cross it off the list and not worry about it. But that is something that we see a little bit more frequently than we do in the general population. Um, some of you may have seen either from publications or other things um, that some people can have slightly different facial features. Um, uh, at least for the children that I've met with HIV EP2, I have to say they're absolutely incredibly handsome, adorable, gorgeous uh, individuals, but they do sometimes have facial features that may be slightly different from their parents or their brothers or their sisters. Um, some of the other things that I think many of you have probably noticed in your children is that their muscle tone, for the most part, has been lower. They've been hypotonic. Um, occasionally, we'll see some uh, problems with being stiff or hypertonic, but for, for the most part, I would say uh, the children I've seen have had low muscle tone, oftentimes within the trunk of the body, um, and that's something that many of you are using physical therapy to try and address. Um, in addition to that, uh, besides what the low tone, some individuals have had problems with posturing, spasticity or dystonia in some cases, or problems in terms of motor coordination, um, being very clumsy or having problems with ataxia. Uh, and so that's something that we see very frequently within individuals. Um, a piece of good news, in my opinion, is that seizures have not been a common part of this condition. So we haven't seen this as being uh, in other neurological conditions, seizures can predominate, and that has not been the case for HIV EP2. So I think that's been a reassuring thing to see. Um, there are some, I've listed some other different neurological uh, manifestations um, in, uh, not in the younger children, but we have had one individual who's been on the older side who's had some movement problems that have been reminiscent of Parkinson's disease. I wouldn't say it's necessarily exactly Parkinson's disease, but there have been some movements that have been like that. Um, some, several individuals actually, when the pediatrician or your neurologist measures the head size, um, they have seen that the head size has been a little bit smaller. And certainly that's also for individuals who had MRIs or imaging of the brain, um, that's also been seen in terms of seeing smaller volume or smaller size of the brain. Um, I would say there haven't been characteristic features, and in fact, overall, uh, I think many of you probably appreciate your doctors probably didn't originally recognize this diagnosis or make the diagnosis except with the genetic testing because the features are not so specific. They're not so unique, and they don't stand out so specifically. Um, there have been a little bit in terms of uh, orthopedic issues, and I would minimize or I would emphasize that this has rel been relatively minor. We have had seen some individuals who've had some problems with their hips um, or who have been essentially having very loose joints, either in the hands or the elbows or the knees. Uh, but I would say for the most part, this has, again, hasn't been a significant problem, at least not that I have seen. Um, gastrointestinal issues are something that we actually see commonly with children with neurological conditions, and that's similar also with HIV EP2. Some individuals have had problems where they haven't been growing, either they've had some trouble gaining weight, and sometimes we'll call that sort of broadly failure to thrive, but it's been issues with gaining weight oftentimes. It's been common for children to have problems with reflux or essentially heartburn, um, and some individuals have needed some medicine for that. Um, it's not uncommon for us to hear about at least a period of time where there may be constipation, uh, and sometimes it even alternates so that children may have periods where they're constipated and other times where they have very loose stools or even diarrhea, and they may go back and forth within the same child even from one day to the next. Um, with this, although it's not common, thankfully, um, some children have had problems in terms of just the length of time it takes for things to go through their stomach and through their intestines being quite delayed, um, so problems with stomach emptying or problems in general with moving things along the intestines. Um, and some of the children have had feeding problems um, to the point of either difficulty swallowing or we'll use the technical term of dysphagia for that. Um, and so that's something oftentimes that the feeding therapists have been eventually helpful with, although it's taken some time. Um, 
On the next set of slides, I want to I emphasize to you some of the vision and the hearing issues. And the reason I uh, sort of singled these out is because for children that are having trouble in terms of their brain perhaps having trouble processing things or uh, needing sort of more time to process things, it's incredibly important that all of the senses are working as well as they can. So what I mean by that is that I want children as they're taking in their world around them to be able to take it in as accurately and sort of as sharply as possible and to make sure that their vision and hearing are as good as they can be um, because we want sort of everything to be getting into their brain and working to be able to simulate their brain appropriately. We don't need to give them additional sort of impediments with any visual problems or any hearing problems. And those have been some things that we've seen, um, you know, more than I would say with the average child. So uh, one of the take home messages is if you're not seeing regular an ophthalmologist, if you don't, you know, have your child's eyes checked out, um, certainly there are some things to watch for. So many of you have already seen that, that your child may have a lazy eye or cross-eyed. Um, sometimes that, or oftentimes that can be treated very well, either with patching or with surgery, but important to do that. And then important, uh, and I know it's sometimes hard for us to tell, but that your child may not be able to see as sharply um, as we might like. And so there are ways, obviously, of correcting that with glasses, um, and we do want to be able to make sure that our kids are being able to see the world around them. Um, although infections are not what I would call a major problem, uh, we certainly have been seeing some children that have had more than their average share of ear infections. And again, the reason that um, I'm focusing on this is because if necessary, we can use ear tubes to make sure that the ears, um, that the children aren't feeling like they're always underwater. Um, and what I mean by that is you, you can imagine if you're in a swimming pool and you're underwater, you can't hear very well. Um, and in the same way, if you're having fluid in the ear all the time, um, it may sound like the world is muffled. And we want to, again, uh, especially in terms of language and language development, we want to make sure the children are hearing well and can uh, assimilate and to learn the language as best that they can. So in addition to that, there are some other things that we see, and I'll be honest, I'm not sure how many of these are actually specific to HIV EP2 and how many of some of these other things are just um, you know, common things that we see in children. Um, so I'll warn you about that you know, as, as we're going through these. Um, we have had one child who's had problems with reflux, or in other words, um, problems where the um, urinary tract, the kidneys, and then the tubes connecting the kidneys to the bladder have had some problems where the urine can sometimes go backwards, uh, back up into the kidneys. And so that's something that uh, if the child, for instance, has a urinary tract infection, will oftentimes do some studies, something called a, a VCUG or vesiculo um, cystiurethrogram to look for that reflux or doing an ultrasound. Kidney stones we've seen just one time, but we have seen kidney stones. Um, and again, asthma is something that's relatively common, but three of the children have had problems with asthma. Um, in addition, there have been some other things, again, not necessarily the most uh, troubling things, except I would say the sleep has been uh, a little bit more troubling. Um, we've had one child that's had problems in terms of temperature and stability, either too hot, too cold. Um, you know, about 25% of the children have had issues with sleep. And then these other things, I think, again, are things that may just be common uh, to all children, but three children with allergies and four children with a variety of um, you know, I would say non-threatening sort of minor skin problems, either a little what we call cafe au lait spot or a spot of skin that's a little bit darker or some the keratosis pilaris or these little bumps, um, almost like goosebumps on the skin. But again, not a serious, not a life-threatening condition in any way. Um, so as we've done this, we are always interested in understanding as parents and sharing with each other what have you tried and what's worked. Um, and to the point of needing medication, uh, the good thing to me is that the children haven't really needed to be on tons and tons of medication, and so I take that as a good sign. Um, there have been, as I said, some issues with sleep and some behavioral issues, so not surprisingly, perhaps, we've seen three of the children on some sort of medication for that. Many parents, uh, or some parents, I should say, have tried supplements of one sort or another, melatonin I've seen, 
uh, in terms of the sleep issue very specifically. And again, as I'd mentioned, uh, gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn has been an issue. And so in terms of um, being able to get that under control, several children are on that. And then a variety of, like I said, uh, we have had a couple of children with seizures, and so they uh, are on medications for that, and then some for the constipation have been on laxatives or inhalers like albuterol for, um, for asthma. So within this, um, I hope you've gotten a sense of, uh, you know, some of what the challenges have been. And let me just take you through a distillation of having learned from that, um, at least what my recommendations are for my patients with HIV EP2. And then I'll get into a couple of the questions that some of you had asked that we talk about. Um, so for some of you, you've had the diagnosis a little bit longer than others. For those of you who may not have had the diagnosis for your children quite as long, um, or eventually if you're kind of a big sister or big brother to someone new to the diagnosis, the things that I recommend to families are once you have a diagnosis, it's a chance to look back um, and to see what some of the other children have had challenges for and do an assessment to see whether or not your child has any of those same issues. Um, I hope the sense that you've gotten is that this is number one, um, it is not a neurodegenerative condition. So in other words, I, I'm not expecting any of the children to deteriorate, to fall back, to lose skills. Um, it may take a lot of practice, more time, more patience to learn skills, um, but in general, it's forward progress that we're looking for. Um, as we're doing that, uh, we, we want to be able to know where the children are at so that we know how best to support them. And I think that's especially important from an educational point of view, knowing what their strengths, but what some of their challenges are so that we can manage to support them and compensate for those issues. And that's what I mean when I say having that complete uh, developmental behavioral evaluation, maybe a school-based program, it may be your early intervention program, um, but doing it, and I want to emphasize that needs to be reassessed um, at least on an annual basis. So, you know, as the children make progress, we obviously want to be able to see that progress and then figure out what new things we need to do to support them as their skills are advancing. Um, as you're doing this, there can be many different um, members of the team that are supporting your child uh, based on the specific challenges that they may have. Uh, and I'll also say that in some cases, it's based on regional differences by how teams are put together. And so the types of people on your team may be folks like uh, myself, like a geneticist, very oftentimes a uh, developmental pediatrician, a neurologist, a psychologist, um, special education teachers or behaviorists in school. Um, there may be a wide sort of different type of individuals that may be helping. Again, if there's a specific medical problem, uh, it may be a gastroenterologist or an orthopedist. Um, but basically, use who you need to and find good people and hopefully good people that work together and talk to each other, communicate, um, and have your, best, your child's best interest at heart. Um, as we're thinking about how we can best support the children, um, you know, I try and do as much as I can, as often as I can, and, uh, you know, make sure that this doesn't become burdensome at some point. So what I mean by that is oftentimes therapies and therapists can be very helpful, um, starting as early as we can with early intervention services or birth to three services, um, and then eventually graduating to the preschool and the school-based program. Um, many of you, I think, probably already know, but for some of you with very young children, uh, by the time the children are in a school program, we want them to have an individualized educational program uh, to be able to tailor their supports that they need in school for them. Um, schools in general, uh, I, at least I've found, and again, if you have especially a very good advocate, one of your doctors working with you, um, the schools tend to be hopefully very good in terms of supplying therapies in school or in your uh, um, birth to three program. And by therapies, I mean people like physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and language, uh, oral motor, feeding therapists, um, working in a sensory gym, all of these things can be quite helpful. Um, in addition, it sometimes medication is necessary and helpful. And, uh, you know, I would just urge you that if, if you need to, it's, you know, it's not a terrible, terrible thing, um, but it is something that you need to talk carefully with your doctors about. Um, in terms of the medical issues, uh, we're not going to have time to go into huge detail, but I want to emphasize that seizures have not been a very common problem 
but if you're seeing staring episodes, if you're seeing abnormal jerking behavior, um, if you have a phone with a video capability, uh, I often tell parents to take a videotape of that and be able to then show it to their neurologist in particular. That can be extremely helpful, and your neurologist may order an EEG or an electroencephalogram to look at the brain waves in particular when those episodes might be happening and seeing if that correlates with seizure activity. Um, as I said, in terms, it's great to have a good ophthalmologist, especially who can help with the eye issues, um, an ENT or ear, nose, and throat doctor if there are some hearing issues or um, uh, problems needing tubes in the ear. And then obviously, um, uh, gastroenterologists can be helpful in terms of some of the gastrointestinal problems. So that ends the segment in terms of the medical issues uh, that we've seen. And I'll open it up for questions in just a second, but I know families that had questions about gene therapy and genome editing and, and were, you know, is this going to hold the promise for uh, individuals with HIV EP2? So uh, I want to very briefly say that gene therapy and, and gene editing specifically is certainly in a time and era uh, like it's never been before. Um, I mean, I remember when I was much younger in my medical training, we always thought gene therapy was going to be amazing. And then due to some historical problems, uh, really basically went quiet for over a decade. Um, and there's been a resilience in terms of being able to do gene editing specifically in a much more precise way. Um, and so I do think it has a lot of hope for us for genetic conditions in the future. But I also want to caution that this is something that actually takes quite a bit of really hard work for a lot of people to get to the point where it can be safe and effective. Right now, this is not something that we're doing. Um, gene therapy or gene editing, save for a very, very few conditions. Um, and believe it or not, for instance, eye conditions happen to be one of the most commonly used for gene therapy. So it's not prime time yet. It's not commonly done, but it is something that we're thinking about for the future. Um, to give a sense of how long sometimes it takes to develop some of these therapies, and this is not even gene therapy, but simply developing a medication. Uh, there's a condition called cystic fibrosis, and that gene was discovered in 1989, and it took over two decades until there was the first FDA-approved medication specifically for cystic fibrosis. On the other hand, I'm actually very optimistic because even though it took 23 years for the first medication, we now have drugs that are FDA approved and extremely effective um, for over 50% of individuals with cystic fibrosis. And so this is one of these things where we stand on the shoulder of those who came before us and we can very, very quickly um, learn based on others' successes as well as mistakes. And it's going to take, I think, a few breakthroughs in the area of gene therapy or gene editing, and then the field is going to break open. Um, but I do want to caution that we're not yet at the point where we've broken the field open. And so um, we need to be patient. And in the meantime, we need to do everything we can to support our children. Um, as we've gone through with the gene, see, can I still advance my slides? Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, so with the gene therapy, uh, the idea is to be able to, now that we know exactly for each of your children, HIV EP2 is the gene with the problem, and we know exactly what the typo or the genetic change is, to be able to essentially swap out the gene with a problem and swap in the new gene. And that's what we think about with gene editing. And again, this can be done with surgical precision. In other words, to take, if it's one single letter that's wrong, to be able to swap out one single letter in and out and to be able to effectuate a change. It does become more challenging to do something like this with the brain, though, that's already fully formed and fully developing. Um, to be able to do this is certainly not trivial. So I want to emphasize it's, it's not as if we can, now that we know this, simply swap out and then fix this and be done with this, you know, within a week and go on. Um, it is something that we're going to have to figure out how to do, not just in one cell, but literally, hopefully, you know, all of the cells, at least in the brain, to do this. And, and to figure out how to do that is going to be challenging. It's not going to be the type of thing that I think, unfortunately, even in the next two or three years, uh, we're going to have mastered. So be patient, but realize there are a lot of smart people that are working on this. And I am cautiously optimistic that in the future, it's going to provide some new opportunities for us. 
So uh, the resources that um, many of you already know about, and we'll certainly make these available for anyone who's interested, Simon's VIP Connect, we continue to keep the website updated in terms of newest information that's coming from the literature. And although it's only two papers so far, there are two papers. Um, as I said, the one at the bottom is Sid's first paper that describes for the first time HIV EP2. And then uh, the paper uh, right above that is listed um, that describes more children with the same uh, condition. And so again, that has overlapping information with what I've described that can also go into more detail if people are interested in reading about that. So I just want to wrap up by saying that all of the things we do are certainly many, many people who've contributed. You've seen many of the uh, individuals who are uh, introduced themselves earlier who are on this slide tonight. I want to give special credit and thanks to Leanne Green Schneider, who actually went through all of the data um, and cleaned and uh, was very careful about reviewing all of the data that came in through Simon VIP. Uh, Mayada is a, a pediatric geneticist who works with me, who is very helpful in terms of aggregating all the data and putting these slides together. Um, Ashley Wilson and Bethany Smith Packard and Heather Roca, many of you know, and Andy Fawcett also actually, all genetic counselors who work with the project, um, as well as Jennifer and Lindsay and Cora, you're about to hear from in just a second. Um, and just because you don't get to see all the pictures you know, uh, of all of us, I just thought it would be helpful so that you can actually see um, what wonderful people are all behind you. So there are a lot of people behind the scenes uh, all trying to do anything we can think of to be able to make this journey just a little bit easier for you. So with that, I'll stop here and uh, Lindsay will help me figure out how to take questions and I'll be glad to take as many questions uh, as we have time for. Um, yeah, so we did not get anyone who's raised their hand yet or sent in any questions um, through the messaging center, but if anyone on the line has any questions, um, feel free to chime in. Um, I just had a quick question for um, Dr. Chong. This is Heather. Um, in the very beginning of your presentation, you were pointing out um, the specific changes that we saw in the HIV EP2. And I didn't catch, you said that some of them have, the gene is completely wiped out, they don't have one working copy, and then some of them did have working copies. Um, can you um, say that again as to which ones did have sure. working copies? So let me, uh, let me just go back to this slide so you can see this. Okay, so this is this um, stick figure, and I guess, Lindsay, you, you don't see my little hand on the screen, is that right? Uh, I don't, but if things, you right. if you go okay. to the upper right hand and you click that little arrow next to the hand, you should be able to, everyone should be able to see uh, it. Okay, let me see if this works at all. Uh, can people see the arrow now? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe if I, uh, maybe that works, I think. Yeah. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so um, of the different, so these are all the different uh, variations that we see in genetic variations. The one that I circled um, and this is, I apologize about the jargon that I'm going to use, but this one has um, at this exact position in the protein, one single, what we call building block or amino acid in the protein that's different. So there are two copies of this gene, one that's perfectly normal. The other copy has just this one teeny tiny change, uh, but we think does change something about probably the binding of this protein or, or an effect that it has. So I'm, not, of, I'm not seeing anything on my screen, so. <laughs> okay, um, just, oh, I'm sorry. You had let mentioned me, let me, from one side or the other, like these five did, and the other so five on the did left, five. Okay, so on the left side, there's a little blue lollipop all the way on the left yep. that says D397Y. So for that, that's the one I was talking about. That's the one okay. sort of outlier or different one. For every okay. other one that you're seeing, um, so there are a bunch of other mm -hmm. ones. Um, that have X's at the end. So nine, let's see, R943X or E953X, all of these other yeah. X or FS's, all of those essentially have the same effects. So that even though they're at different places along the protein, they all effectively have the same downstream effect on the protein, which is that it doesn't make it for that second copy. So with all, I haven't shown this very well, but let me see if I can, I don't know if this draws out. Um, for each of us, we usually have two copies of our gene. 
Um, for individuals that with HIV EP2 that I've shown here, they have one copy of the gene that basically is fine. It's working perfectly well. And I don't know if it's showing on the screen or not. Um, but then there's one copy of the gene that essentially is just, it didn't show up to the party. It's not doing what it's supposed to. If it's present, it's like the D397Y. Right. It's just not doing its job, even though it's there. And for all these other ones at the protein level, it's as if it didn't show up for the party and there's only one copy of the gene that's working. And in this particular okay. case, one copy of the gene can't do enough. It can do something. Right. It can work. It can try really hard, but it's not quite doing everything it should. So one right. interesting I was just thinking thing down the road. If, so that's um, exactly if we got to where genetic editing and copying could be done. That if there was still one functioning copy, then the chances of being able to kind of change and, and mutate things um, in a positive way would be something that would be easier. Yep, you're ab and you're absolutely right. So one of the things we've done with other genetic diseases is um, essentially tried to figure out how to make that one copy of the gene that's working, how do we make it work harder? How do we make it make more protein? How do we, you know, use whatever advantage we can in terms of getting that one copy that's perfectly fine, how do we get it to compensate and make maybe as much of the protein as two genes uh, normally would? So I absolutely agree. That's one strategy to think about, and that you know doesn't necessarily require some of the things we've been talking about with the gene editing, um, and and that's one of the strategies that we could we could actually pursue in terms of getting this to work. So use it. We have to think about how to use it as an asset. You're absolutely right. Other questions? 